fact, all three important truths. I'm going to talk about Jacob, Joseph, and Job. And I almost put in Jonah, but I thought I'd not make it too long. But he's got a good message, too, there. All right. Let's talk about these three important truths. All right, Jacob. Remember who Jacob is. Jacob uh, had Abraham, Isaac. Now, Jacob. Jacob was a twin. Esau was his older brother. He's the younger brother. Uh, but they're two different people. Esau was the outside guy, the hunter. Jacob stayed more at home. And Esau didn't care really about the things of God. Jacob did. But Jacob was also a tricky, tricky kind of guy. So one day when Esau's all hungry from out hunting, Jacob cooks up a big stew and he said, give me some of that to eat. He says, if you will give me your birthright. And he traded his birthright for stew, which is a whole other message there. I've done that one. <laughs> and then later on, it looks like Isaac, the dad, is going to die. And Isaac says to his son Esau, who's the hunter, go out and get me some wild game and feed that to me and then I'll give you the blessing before I die. So Esau goes out hunting, but the mother, who's more uh, Jacob, is her favorite. She says, I overheard what he said. I, let's go get a goat. I'm going to cook up that goat. You're going to take it to him. And he says, but he'll know me. No, i got to figure it out. She took some of the goat hair and put it on Jacob so he would seem hairy. And he went into East, uh, Isaac, who was getting old, couldn't see well, and he said, the boy sounds like Jacob. Of course, they're identical twins. The boy sounds like Jacob. He said, no, it's me. It's me, Esau. And he said, come over here closer. And he has Esau's clothes on. He smells like Esau. He's got the hairy arms. He said, yes, it is you, Esau. And let me give you the blessing. And he gives them the blessing. And by the time Esau gets there, he said, I brought you something, Dad. Oh, I already gave the blessing to your brother, Jacob. So now Jacob, by tricky uh, dealings, has got the birthright and the blessings. And here's what Esau says. As soon as my dad dies, I'm going to kill him. He is dead man. I'm going to kill him. And Jacob decides it's time for him to leave town. And so he goes to his mother's family in another town. And that's where we know he marries and gets, builds a family, has 13 children. And, uh, but then he gets in trouble with his father-in-law, so now he's headed back. It's been 20 years, and he's heading back to his, where his brother lives. The brother who said, the last word he says was, I'm going to kill Jacob. So he sent some people ahead to give them, in case, because he knows he's going through Jacob's territory, or Esau's territory. And they come back and they say, Esau's coming with 400 armed men. A small army, and Jacob thinks he's dead, and his family's dead. So that's when he, he divides his family so at least one part can get away, and we come to this scripture now, where we are, when he's heading back towards Esau. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. Wrestled all night. When the man saw he did not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. When he touched him and he just went limp just from a touch, he knew this was no ordinary man. And he called it later to play the face of God because he knew this is an angel of the Lord. He's wrestling. And so Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Now in the book of Hosea, it also describes this, and it says that he wrestled with the angel and won, the angel of the Lord. He wept and pleaded. And those verses, the words describe something where he is just sobbing and begging. You've got to help me. Esau's coming with 400 armed men. He's going to kill me. He promised to kill me. My family is in danger. I can't let you go. I'm not leaving this until you promise me you're going to help me, God, because i got nothing else to do. i planned and I've tried everything I can do and I can't do anymore. God, you've got to help me. You ever been in a place where you depended and needed God like that? It's not a bad place to be. And God, this is what God was wanting. Jacob, who always had another plan, who could always figure it out, needed to humbly depend on God. And so he says, what is your name? He replied, Jacob. He said, you will no longer be called Jacob. From now on, you will be called Israel. 
because you have fought with God and with men and have won. If you get on the news today and you may see Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel, where did the nation of Israel get its name? From this night when Jacob was transformed from the tricker to the prince who had power with God and power with men. Why? Because he grabbed onto him and depended on him and humbly turned to God with all his heart. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip, and limped the rest of his life. Then, it's morning now, Jacob looked up and he saw Esau coming with his 400 men. As Jacob approached, he, Jacob approached his brother, he bowed to the ground seven times. He showed his humility. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they both wept. Truth number one, when you wrestle with God, keep holding on to him for blessing. Because when trouble comes, when we suffer, when we hurt, we get a little bit of aggravated with God, there's a temptation to push God away. If that's the way you're going to treat me, I don't need you. Forget you. But it's the opposite. When you wrestle with God, and I've been wrestling with God lately, when you wrestle with Him, hold on to Him tighter and say, I've got to have you to bless me. I can't go anywhere else. It doesn't go, do any good to go anywhere else. When trouble comes in your life, when you wrestle with God, keep holding on to Him for blessing. Now, what was His blessing? The limp didn't look like a blessing at all. But you know what I think? Esau maybe didn't even know himself what he was going to do to Jacob. He had had bitterness and thoughts of revenge for 20 years. Why would he bring 400 armed men? But Jacob bows down humbly, and Esau saw his twin brother, 20 years older, limping. And it did something to his heart. And he got down off the horse, and he ran to him, and he hugged him, and he cried, and there was a reunion. And I think he could see something different in Jacob. And it made a difference in how he treated him, the reconciliation. And people can see us if we think we're cocky and got it all together, or if we're humble too. But the point is, we are all going to go through trouble in our lives, and there's a temptation to say, ah, forget it, God, that's the way you're going to treat me. But it's the opposite, and it's true. We need to grab onto him and say, I don't know why you're doing this. I don't know why. I don't know why you say that you, God, but... I'm having money troubles, or they call, they said they don't know what how my health is going to be. Or I've lost a person on work that meant the most to me in this world. And I don't know why you did it. But you've got to help me. You've got to help me through it, God. So this is true. Number one, when you wrestle with God, keep holding on to him for blessing. Number two, Joseph. Joseph, or Jacob had 12 sons and one daughter. One of his sons, who was a little boy there when that went on, grew up and he became like Jacob's favorite son. And you know that story, Jacob gave him a special robe or coat. Some call it the coat of many colors. And Jake, Joseph started having dreams about the future. And one of them was that his brothers would bow down to him and they got a little bit resentful. Here's the favorite guy who's having these dumb dreams. So one day, Jacob said, Joseph, check on the other brothers. They're out there with the sheep. Check on them, see how they're doing. And he goes out there, and they sit, some of them said, there comes the dreamer. We ought to just kill him. I'm tired of him telling us of dreams and special treatment. And Reuben, the oldest, said, no, he didn't want to kill him. He wanted to rescue him. So he said, let's, just, let's put him in this pit here. There's a dry hole there. Let's put him in there, and we'll see what we're going to do. He thought if they thought about it, they'd quit. Well, they put him, as soon as Joseph came, they grabbed, took his special coat off, threw him in the pit, and I'm sure he's thinking, what, what are my brothers doing to me? 
And then they finally decided, Judah had the idea when they saw the traitors coming, going to Egypt, let's sell him into slavery. And they sold their own brother as a slave in Egypt. They took the coat, they put blood on it from an animal, sent it to the father as if an animal had killed Joseph. And he said, I'm going to mourn the rest of my life as Joseph is gone. Now this story we like because we know it has a happy ending. But before you get to the happy ending, you've got to have some stuff that's not so happy. And that was what happened to Joseph. Sold by his brothers into slavery. When he got down there, if you remember, he was a slave to Potiphar, who liked him. But one day his wife tried to seduce Joseph. Joseph would have none of it, ran away. And so she said he tried to get her. They believed the lie and put him in prison. Wow, it went from bad to worse. He's in prison, and the guy who runs the prison, the warden, likes Joseph so much, he puts him in charge. He helps out some guy, he gets restored to Pharaoh, and he said, now remember me. I'm tired of being in this prison. Remember me to Pharaoh. Maybe I can get out of here. And the guy doesn't say a thing. And so again, he's disappointed. And we tell the story in minutes, but this is years. And it's like, can't you see where Joseph would be tempted to say, God, I don't get it. I trusted you. I had faith in you. I worshipped you. And what am I doing here? Away from my family. My own brothers turn away from me. I try to do right, and I get penalized for it, and I'm thrown in prison. If anybody had the temptation to be bitter, it would be Joseph. But we know that he had a, had a chance finally to go to Pharaoh to interpret his dream predict the famine that was coming. Pharaoh made him second highest in Egypt. He oversaw gathering all the food so they'd be ready for the famine. And when the famine hit, all the other nations came to Egypt to get food, including Jacob's brothers. And you remember at first they didn't recognize him, but finally he revealed himself to him. And wouldn't you like to have been Joseph then? Okay, guys, throw me in a pit, will you? But Joseph had mercy on them. The whole family, Jacob and the whole family, he saved what would become the nation of Israel from which Jesus would descend because he was thrown into prison. When Jacob died, they got afraid of Joseph, and this is when Joseph said this, You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me into this position so I could save the lives of many people. Wow. We learn you have to take the long view. The happy ending, Joseph didn't know it began. I like this. Somebody named Kimberly Henderson wrote this. I didn't put it up there, I don't think, but she wrote this. I would have pulled Joseph out, out of that pit out of that prison, out of that pain. And I would have cheated nations out of the one God could use to deliver them from famine. I would have pulled David out, out of Saul's spear throwing presents, out of the caves he hid away in, out of the pain of rejection, and I would have cheated Israel out of a God-hearted king. I would have pulled Esther out, out of being snatched from her only family, out of being placed in a position she never asked for, out of a path of a vicious, power-hungry foe. And I would have cheated a people out of the woman God would use to save their very lives. And I would have pulled Jesus off, off the cross, off the road that led to suffering and pain, off the path that would mean nakedness and beatings, nails and thorns. And I would have cheated the entire world out of a Savior, out of salvation, out of an eternity filled with no more suffering and no more pain. I think we all get the point. We figure we can do it better than God. Hey, that, don't let him suffer. But we don't know what God is up to. And so that's truth number two. Even when it looks bad, God has a plan for good. Wow. Wow. Now, I'm not trying to give you trite, simple, easy answers so we can just lot it out. It's all right. Give me your best shot. I know that's not the way it is. I know it hurts. But I am trying to give us something to be able to deal with faith with what's happening in our lives. 
that we don't know all that's going on. But we have to trust that God has a plan for good. That's what the sort of says in Romans 8, 28. God is saying, if you believe and you follow him, God is going to turn bad stuff and somehow bring some good out of it. We're still going to have bad stuff. And that's part of the truth of the whole Bible. Good people, bad people, in the middle, we all have bad things happen to us. And we're all going to die. <laughs> But the thing is, he's saying that God can take the bad and bring good out of it. So God has a plan for good. And number three, and this one really deserves a whole sermon, is the answer. I told you I was giving some easier answers and some more answers, but this is the answer, and it's not even an answer. Okay, what are you talking about? Now you're talking crazy. Job. You remember the story of Job. Probably the oldest book in the Bible. If not certainly one of the oldest. And Job is a book that discusses the, the question, the problem. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because people have been discussing that, thinking about it, writing about it. I'm telling you there's volumes written about that. For thousands of years it went to people's mind when they had I've been trying to be good. And what does it get me? Trouble and sickness and pain and hate. And that's what Job is about. And you know the story? Job was a, a good man. A man that God liked. And he had more trouble than most of us. His family, most of them were killed. His, he, he lost his property and his finances. And then his health was attacked. Until he just sit there in grief and pain wondering what in the world's going on so some friends came and at first the friends did pretty good they just sit there with him presence which is sometimes when people are first going through something they just need to know somebody's with them but after a while they went what is a lot of what people think about why things happen you must be punished by God and so they started saying Joe Come on. Come on, tell the truth. You really had some hidden sin. You need to repent. God wouldn't be doing this unless you were sinning. And one of the main points of the book of Job is, is that's not necessarily true. You can have bad things happen to you and be a wonderful person. And that we shouldn't be, we are not the judge of what goes on in people's lives and why that's happening to them. And we need to resist that temptation and cut it out. Well, they must have been, they're having that trouble. They must have been really doing something bad we don't know about. How do you know that? You don't, so you know what comes there. I'm, say. I'm tempted to, too. And one of the points of the book of Job is no. Bad things in this world, the way this world is now, we're all in it together. We're all going to face sickness or somebody we know sick. We're all going to die or somebody we love die. That's the way it is in this world. And it's not necessarily... Now, I do believe there's a good... something valuable about following God's plan. I would like marriage. I think if you follow God's plan for marriage, it's going to be a happier marriage if both of you cooperate in that course. I do think of things about money. If you follow some, it's going to be better for you. But it's not a guarantee or a promise that you're not going to have trouble. So finally, Job, who was good at first, starts whining. And who can blame him? Because I did too. And he starts whining. Why are you doing this, God? I didn't do it. Wrong. I've been good. I've been a good guy. This is what I get for being good. I thought even, I shouldn't have even been born. And finally we see the end of the book and God shows up. Here's what it said. The Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man. Because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Now, put yourself 
If you've been whining to God and mad at God and wrestling with God, and God shows up. Whoops. I mean, if we really, if we really have an idea of God, who God really is, and we know He was on the thing, I, I'd be shaking like a leaf. That God is there. Brace yourself like a man. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Where does light come from? And where does darkness go? Can you direct the movement of the stars? And yes, stars do move, not just in the sky, they're appearing. Do you know the laws of the universe? Now that's a good one because some of the ones now who believe the universe just got here, they act like the laws, they're already there. Where did the laws of the universe come from? A famous man recently said before he died, well, I don't know why, how the, the universe ever started. I think it just must be because of gravity. Where did gravity come from? Where did all these minute laws that regulate just to a very nth degree about how atoms stay together and the whole thing is regulated? We don't know. And Job didn't know. Do you know the laws of the universe? Can you use them to regulate the earth? Can you shout to the clouds and make it rain? Hey, we need some rain clouds. Come on down. Now, obviously, the answer is no. Can you make lightning appear and cause it to strike as you direct? Who gives intuition to the heart and instinct to the mind? Wow, that's a great verse because it's, it backs up what I believe, that we know more than we've ever been taught. You've been taught some things since you were a child, but somehow we know intuitively there is more than just this life. That death is not right and it's not the end. That there is more than this, that there is some kind of God. There is a spirituality, not just a physicality. We know that intuitively. You see it in every culture throughout history. Somehow we know there's more. And I think God who created us in His image placed that in us. Who gives intuition to the heart and instinct to the mind? Is it your wisdom that makes the hawk soar? and spread its wings toward the earth? Is it at your command that the eagle rises to the heights to make its nest? Then the Lord said to Job, Do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but do you have the answers? Wow! <laughs> what a passage. Then Job replied to the Lord, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. I know you can do anything, and no one can stop you. You ask who it is that questions my wisdom and such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things too far wonderful for me. So truth number three. There is a God. I'm not him. God, I, I Job, I don't have to handle stuff. I'm the creator. I'm the regulator now of what goes on. I can handle stuff. I know what I'm doing. And you don't. And that is the answer that is not an answer. Why did this bad thing happen to me? And God never tells him. In the book that is all about that major question, God does not tell him why bad things happen. Now it gets at it at the beginning with the, with the devil and Bob that we're in a big cosmic conflict. And that we don't know all that's going on. Right now we do not know what's going on in the world, in politics, in governments, in media, in colleges, in churches, in religion. The conflict that is going on. But there is a spiritual cosmic that's been going on all through the ages. And we don't even realize a lot of times it's going on. And in all of that, God just still doesn't say, I don't have to give you an answer. I know what I'm doing. I'm God. And that is the answer. I don't want to be smug. I don't want to count anybody's suffering as if it doesn't matter or just, you know, write it off and say, forget about that. 
Because I deal with it just like you do in wrestling God. But the answer is, there is a God who we couldn't understand if he told us everything that's happening. And he does not usually tell us what he's doing. And so, it says here in Romans 11, how great are God's riches in wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? Well, I thought I did. Because <laughs> I tried it lately. And maybe you've tried too. And I get it. I get it more than ever. How you can doubt God when you're suffering. How you can be aggravated and disappointed with God. And some doubt there even is a God. Many have done that. If this is the way, if he's supposed to be good and powerful and he doesn't do anything and all these bad things happen to me, it must not even be a God. And you know what? I even get that. I don't agree with it, but I get it. That's how you feel, God. If you're not... What? You must not even be there. But I cannot come to a belief that there is no God. That this universe just got here. That all these laws just got here. That when we did have all this matter, that it somehow just became creatures and finally humans. That humans, that life came from non-life. When we know we never see that happen now. Well, a lightning hit a puddle, and what a lousy, cheap, sorry answer. <laughs> they're falling off a cliff, and they're grasping for straws. Well, the, you know, gravity, you know, it just happened, and so the universe just happened, and, and life just happened, and, you know. And then consciousness, how did it become conscience, or have a soul? Well, we don't, you know. And if you do doubt God, then you got you got something to also, you have to doubt and wonder, what do I really believe? See, everybody's got to really choose to believe. Or some people say, well, I don't know if there's God or not. So it ain't like it doesn't matter. Well, that's what they choose. I'm not even going to think about it. Wow, it's too important for that. Again, this is not easy. As I said at the beginning, no easy answers. But I believe it is the real deep answer. There is a God. And if he really is the God who made all the universe, there's no way we could comprehend everything he's doing, even if he told us. And so there's choices. God, no God. And if you do believe there's a God, then believe what you believe. I believe there's a God. Then believe it. Believe it. There is a God. He is wonderful. He is magnificent. He is high and lifted up. He is all wisdom and all knowledge. And he loves us. He told us that. Amen. And so I believe it. Do I understand what he's doing? No way. But when I really see him lifted up at God, I have to shut my mouth. You are God. And I trust you. And that's not always easy. But you've got to choose one to believe. God knows what he's doing. And I say we believe that. There is a loving God who loved us so much. He sent his son to die, which we'll never understand. That pain and suffering. And I choose to believe in God and his son. Amen. 